Okay. When I meditate, I always want to investigate my thought. Why I'm feeling that? What is the reason of my fear? What is the cause of this? Is it a good thing to do? You have to understand what the purpose of meditation is. That finding out the cause of things is not the true purpose of meditation. It's interesting, um, but you have to see the flaw in what you're saying. Um, the the you know, reality is like a river; everything goes in order, right? But on the other hand, it's quite complex. So to say X is the cause of Y um, is a simplistic understanding of how things work. If you sit there and what you're talking about is saying, okay, I'm, I'm angry this morning and the cause is that I um, you know, was unmindful you know, and I allowed my uh, you know, to, to the anger to come, or the the processing of an of a experience to lead to anger. Now that's that's one part of the story. The question is, why did why were you unmindful in the first place, and what happened in between the time when you were unmindful and the time when you got angry? There's many things going on. Pinpointing one specific thing as saying this is a cause uh, intellectually, it it. it has some value then, because you say, oh, well, then I should be more mindful. Um, and that sort of thing does happen in meditation, but that's not meditation. It it doesn't solve the problem. Um, in fact, meditation does begin by identifying momentary causes. So from one moment to the next, seeing what what mind proceeds, what... Um, or what, what what cause precedes what result, but it's a very it's still a very limited, a very preliminary, basic understanding. That understanding is also not enough. It's not the true reason for practicing. It's not the the highest insight. The highest insight is to see that things arise based on a cause. To see things um, are dependently arisen. That's it. To to not what was the cause but to see the things arising and ceasing. It comes and then it goes. So that's to see impermanence. It's also to see dukkha, which means inability to satisfy because it's impermanent, and non-self, to see that there's no essence to it. It's about the Dhamma itself, about the experience itself. That's what we're most interested in. We are... Um, because the cause of suffering is simply attachment to things. So, so cause and effect doesn't directly, it's indirectly can be useful, but directly does not tie into that. The craving is simply caused by seeing that things are, are stable, satisfying, and controllable. Once you see that things are not thus, then you let go of them. And when you let go of them, you become free. When you're free, you say, I'm free. Nothing more needs to be done. So, is it useful? Yes, arguably that has some intellectual benefit because it's going to say, well, then I shouldn't do that or I should adjust myself. It allows you to be, it's sort of a meta-analysis, M-E-T-A, uh, that allows you to adjust your practice. This we would call vimangsa. It allows you to succeed. So there's benefit to it. Don't think that it's a replacement to meditation. It's not. It's 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 a a non-meditative process. At that moment, you're actually not meditating because you're not observing things simply as they are. You're reflecting on them. You're intellectualizing about them. You're reflecting, processing your memories of things, which in fact can be flawed. But that's not the biggest problem. The biggest problem is its memories. It's, okay, this happened like this, happened like this, which is all in the past. And is not... Is not um, cannot be a replacement for true insight. So, not wrong, not bad, but not insight meditation.